Thank you, Dennis. Um, if I can get Maruf. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Maruf Saad, and I work in the lab of Dr. Wegon Keko at the VA. The title of my project is Alcohol Dysregulated Micrornas in the Pathogenesis of Oropharyngeal Cancer. Um, before I get into my project, I have a quick story I'd like to share with you guys about an experience I had this summer that changed the way I view the, my, the research I do and really research in general. Um, this summer, in addition to doing research, I was studying for a pretty major exam I had to take. And one day I'd come home from the library and, you know, I went to take a shower and everything and change and I noticed that I had some swelling and a lump in a place that I didn't have it before. So being that I've been doing cancer research for two years, my mind immediately went to the worst case scenario and I thought, you know, maybe it's cancer. Um, considering where it was and what I knew, I knew that there was a chance it could be because the type of cancer does affect people my age. So. At first, I don't know if it's just my, my brain trying to protect itself, but I thought, you know, it's probably nothing. Um, I thought maybe I had bumped into something and I didn't notice, or maybe I was just really stressed out about my test. So I kind of just put it on the back burner and didn't think about it. Um, so next day, I go, go about my business doing everything like normal, and I didn't think about it at all. Then went home, and it was still there. Another day goes by, same thing, it's still there. Third day, still there. So now I start getting pretty worried. And by this point, they had pretty much taken over everything I was thinking about. I stopped thinking about my work or my test. So finally, my girlfriend convinced me to go get a doctor's appointment and see what was wrong. So I made an appointment. It was for the next day. I went, and he was not a specialist who really knew too much, but he wasn't able to say it was what I thought it was, but he also wasn't able to rule out what I thought it was. So he referred me to a specialist. The, the appointment was two days away. That was the earliest I could get. And those were probably two of the longest days I've ever had because all I could think about the whole time was what was wrong with me. And I've probably read 50 papers on cancer, and I've, I've read so many statistics, and none of it really... It doesn't sink in because it's not you, but once you think it could be you, it really changes everything, it changes your whole perspective on it. And nothing became important anymore, I was just worried about my health. Um, so the only thing I could do was I started looking up other papers that people had, had published to see if it is what I thought it was, what can I do? And really that's the only thing that gave me hope, that all the advancements that we've made in, in the last few decades have really changed the way cancer is treated. And that really does comfort people. And I think at its ultimate purpose, that's what our research is for, too. Um, so anyway, two days go by. Finally, I got to go see the specialist. And what they do is they take an ultrasound and they actually look at, uh, at what it is. And the whole time he was, he was doing it, I was just looking at his face to try to read his reaction because I just couldn't wait anymore. And after about five minutes, he looked at me and he said, uh, you know, it's not cancer. It's not what you thought it was, but I'm not sure what it is. All I heard was it's not cancer, so I was just so happy at that point. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, I've seen other doctors since. I don't want to get into the details. I'm fine. It's okay. But the point is, <laughs> the point is it really changed my perspective on what I'm doing and what we do in my lab because... This work really does have a profound impact on people, and it really gives them hope. So uh, with that said, I'll, uh, I'll get into what I did and uh, hopefully what I can contribute. So again, it's, it's called Alcohol Dysregulated MicroRNAs in the Pathogenesis of Oropharyngeal Cancer. What that boils down to is we studied the effects of alcohol consumption and how it dysregulated a particular class of non-coding RNAs known as microRNAs. Ultimately, how those microRNAs, those, the change in the expression of those particular microRNAs would cause the initiation and, project and progression of oropharyngeal cancer. So uh, since it's kind of a mixed audience, I'll do just a quick run through of some basic biology. Cancer is 
most often defined as unregulated cell growth and division. And eventually, if cancer gets severe enough, it will metastasize, and that's more often, everyone knows that as the cancer spreading. If that happens, the cancer cells spread to other parts of the body through the blood or the lymph, and it will cause multi-organ failure and eventually death. Uh, the image I have on the right is some of the thoughts that pop into someone's head when they hear that they might have cancer or they have cancer, and it's similar to what I was thinking. And one of them is, what can I find research on my type of cancer? So as far as we're concerned, cancer in the lab is just in plates. And one of the dangers of this is we start to forget what we're doing. Uh, one of the worst things that can happen when you're working in a lab is your cells die because you have to start over. And so we kind of start to baby these cells and we forget how devastating they can be in the body. So this is what cancer actually looks like. Uh, these patients have different types of oral cancer. The two on the left have pretty severe cases and the larger image, I don't know how many baseball fans are here, but that's Tony Gwynn who just died a couple months ago of oral cancer from tobacco use. Uh, so cancer is caused mainly by two primary mutations of oncogenes or tumor suppressors. Oncogenes are genes that are mutated by a cancer-causing agent, and that could be anything from UV light and skin cancer or smoking, or in our case, alcohol consumption. What that causes is the normal gene, what's known as a proto-oncogene, which is kind of a pre-oncogene, to become an oncogene, and then that oncogene will give rise to the cancer cells. The other, uh, the other cell type that could be affected, or the other gene that could be affected, is known as a tumor suppressor. And the one I have here is P53, which is shown to be dysregulated in over 50% of tumors. What a tumor suppressor does is it acts as a roadblock in the cell cycle. And when there's mutated DNA or cells that shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be replicating, a tumor suppressor will stop it there. But when you have mutations, the cell cycle continues to run through, and that's where you get the unregulated division of the cells and the continued prol proliferation, which we're going to see a little bit later on. So just some statistics on head and neck cancer. It's the sixth most common cancer worldwide, and there's approximately 47,000 new cases diagnosed in the United States each year. Uh, an interesting thing about head and neck cancer and oral cancer is that 80% of incidences involve alcohol or tobacco use. The other major risk factor for this type of cancer is HPV infection. Uh, so microRNAs, they're the class of small non-coding RNAs. There's a few, and this one is one of the most well-known and most studied uh, classes of them. It's about 21 to 25 nucleotides in length, which is, if you don't have a frame of reference, that's extremely small relative to genes and things like that. Uh, they play a role in post-transcriptional processing of genes, so they play a, a gene regulatory role since they don't code for proteins. And what they do is, there's one of two ways they do that. One of them is that they bind directly to a, a transcribed mRNA and they target it for degradation. The other way is they modify the chromatin complex, which won't allow transcription factors and other things in to cause the transcription of particular genes. And there's, there's been a number of studies that have shown that they do have a profound effect on oncogenesis and tumorigenesis which is why we're interested in them. So a uh, project could be divided into three different aims. The first one is we wanted to identify microRNAs that were dysregulated when we compared patients with oropharyngeal cancer and looking at the two groups, one of which being those who drank and those who were not drinkers. The second thing we wanted to do was verify those findings in vitro. And finally, we wanted to characterize the potential roles of the microRNAs we identified, which means we wanted to not only identify which ones were dysregulated, we wanted to come up with a theory on the mechanism by which they do cause the initiation and progression of the cancer. So the first aim was uh, the clinical findings. And we did this by analyzing patient data from 136 different patients with oropharyngeal cancer. We got our data from the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is an online database, and a couple members of the lab went through and uh, did quite a bit of analysis on this, and we're able to find that when we compared the two groups, there was eight microRNAs that were differentially expressed. So these are the eight microRNAs. I would read off the names, but they're, they really won't tell you anything about their function. It's just mere followed by a number. And so the next thing we wanted to do was take those eight microRNAs that we identified and see if we could replicate their dysregulation in vitro in our, cell, in our tissue culture. So to do that, we had to come up with a treatment plan that would simulate long-term alcohol exposure. 
And to do that, we first read a few papers to see if anyone else had tried something similar. And we also established a treatment condition where we could see the viability of cells at certain doses of, of ethanol. And from this, from this graph down here, you could see that anything above 1% caused cell death. So this graph is representative of cell proliferation. At 1, it's all the same, and then it starts to dip here. We wanted our cells to stay viable the entire treatment. So we didn't want anything that would kill them, and therefore we chose 1% as our top end. And based on this, we chose 0.1%, 0.3%, and 1% as our three doses, being representative of light drinkers, moderate drinkers, and heavy drinkers, respectively. So once, and once the one-month treatment was done, we did one month of treating them with those doses every single day. Once that was done, the next thing we did was, ice, was isolate the cells, and then, har well, we harvested the cells and isolated RNA from the cells, reverse transcribed that to complementary DNA, and did PCRs. And the PCRs allowed us to analyze the expression of those microRNAs that, we've, that we identified in the clinical data. And by doing that, out of the eight we identified, six also matched in our in vitro data. And in particular, there were two, MIR 30A and MIR 934, that had very high dysregulation. You could see here up to sixfold and fivefold in the two different cell lines. So ethanol in itself is not considered to be a carcinogen. Uh, it, it is believed to cause cancer by increasing the effects of other carcinogens, but oh, sorry, excuse me. Is there a mouse somewhere? Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so acetaldehyde is the first metabolite of ethanol. So in the body, ethanol is first metabolized into acetaldehyde, and acetaldehyde is considered to be a carcinogen. Since we couldn't, uh, you can't really simulate the metabolism in your tissue culture, we had to directly add acetaldehyde to our cells. And since it's much more, de uh, much more toxic to the cells, it was instead of a one-month regimen, it was only two days. And what we found was, after doing that, and again, harvesting our cells and isolating the RNA, and doing the PCRs that we observed even greater dysregulation, this time up to 50-fold in OKF4 and OKF6, which are our two normal oral lines. So that tells us that those dysregulations that we observed in the patients, we were able to replicate in vitro, which is very promising. So at this point, we developed a theory that the microRNAs that we observed to be dysregulated were acting as oncomeres. Specifically, we were now focused on mirrors 30A and 934, since we observed the greatest dysregulation in those two. So the next step and the final aim of the project was to characterize those microRNAs and how they may be causing the initiation and progression of the disease. So the first functional assay we did is known as the MTS proliferation assay. It's similar to the other two I was describing about cell viability. And what it does is it tells us how many cells there are after a certain amount of time. And in this case, we took two cell lines that are head and neck cancer cell lines, and we transfected them with premiers, which increased the expression of the microRNAs we were studying. And again, we chose MIR 30 a and 934. So we increased the expression of those two microRNAs and then subjected them to this MTS assay. And what we found was after just five days, there was a two-fold increase in proliferation. So going back to what cancer is, one of the hallmarks is that increase in proliferation. So showing that in just five days, all we did was increase the expression of those two microRNAs, and we got double as many cells in the plates. So the next thing we wanted to look at was stem cell markers. The reason we look at stem cell markers is because cancer stem cells are critical to the, the initiation of the, the t primary tumor and then the replication and differentiation of the cancer cells. Again, we overexpressed the two microRNAs we were interested in, and we found that four, four genes associated with the stemness of head and neck cancer, NANOG, OCT4, CD44, and BMI1, were all had increased expression. And to test this, again, we did a knockdown, which is we decreased the expression of the two microRNAs to see what would happen, hoping that if we decrease it, there would be also a decrease in expression of these stem cell markers. And what we found was decreasing the expression of the two microRNAs also decreased the expression of those stem cell markers. So we showed it going both directions. And the last thing we did is known as an invasion assay. So an invasion assay is representative of the, the cancer, the primary tumor's ability to cross through the basement membrane and begin to spread throughout the body. And what we did here was, since we were using head and neck cancer uh, cell lines, they already have an innate ability to invade. So what we wanted to do was decrease the expression of those two microRNAs to see if we could decrease their ability to, to invade. 
So again, we did, we used siRNA plasmids and decreased the expression of both of them, and we noted that these two are the knockdowns, MIR 30A knockdown and MIR 934 knockdown, and you could see in the two cell lines, compared to control, there's a decrease in invasion. And so to go a little bit deeper in that, we decided to treat the cells with a chemotherapy drug that's used for patients with head and neck cancer, known as cisplatin. And this time we wanted to treat them with cisplatin and knock down the expression of the two microRNAs to see if that would cause an even greater decrease in invasion. In fact, it did. If you look at the red bar, the red bar graphs, that's just treating with cisplatin. And then the green and blue are the cisplatin plus the knockdown. And the significance of this is this could be a potential targeted treatment, whereas we give the patients the chemotherapy drug and also target those two microRNAs, and that will, those two together will decrease the ability of the cancer to spread throughout their body. Uh, so just to summarize the findings, we identified the eight microRNAs in the, in, in the clinical data. We went on to verify six of those in vitro and then characterized MIR-30A and 934 using those functional assays I just described. And we believe that MIRS 38 and 934 acting as oncomirs, promoting the initiation and progression of the cancer, again, through the different methods described by the functional assays. And initially, these findings will serve as biomarkers, whereas you could see if a patient has increased expression of the two microRNAs and note that they may have an early stage of oropharyngeal cancer caused by alcohol consumption. And ultimately, they could be used for targeted treatment, like I said, with the invasion and the cisplatin together. Uh, so that's it, and I'd like to thank my PI, Wegon Kecko, and uh, a few people from my lab, Selena Kuo, Ella Mahimi, Angela Zhao, Hao Zhang, and Elizabeth Kim. The project couldn't have been done without them. It was a, a lot of work. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank Khaled and specifically Amira for all the day-to-day -day stuff. It was, it was a really good experience. So thanks a lot, everybody. And I'll take any questions. This has been going on for quite a while. It's quite a bit of work, so let me do it as well. That it? Okay, thank you. Okay, and then last but not least, uh, Bryce.